Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. This is the keynote uh, lecture of the Landscape Urbanism uh, MARC program. Uh, with this keynote we'll uh, conclude or close the presentations of our MARC and we have the enormous pleasure and honor uh, to host Sebastian Marot. Uh, Sebastian Marot uh, work uh, we've been following his work for some time right now, and it's a uh, great delight that we can, you know, finally have you and, and, and learn about uh, some of your ideas in person. So I'm just going to read quickly um, a short uh, bio. Sebastian Mara was initially trained in philosophy and holds a PhD in history, and he's currently a professor in the environmental history at the School of Architecture in the in University of its Paris, and also a guest professor at the uh, EPFL. Uh, in 2019, he curated an, uh, an exhibition called Taking the Countryside, Agriculture and Architecture for the Lisbon Architecture uh, Triennale that has been traveling since. And uh, without further ado, uh, thank you very much for joining us, Sebastian. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, you. You can hear me. So thank you very much. It's always a great pleasure to to come back uh, to this uh, school. Um, I think the last time was like something like three years ago, uh, when on the invitation of Pierre Vittorio Aureli, I already came to talk about this exhibition, which was fresher at the time. So I'm sorry for those who were at this lecture uh, three years ago. There's some things that I will uh, get back to uh, today. I'm also very happy because uh, in very soon, uh, the AA, uh, who, which had published uh, uh, this book, Suburbanism and the Art of Memory, uh, that was back in 2003, uh, is going to issue very soon a release, a uh, second edition of this book, uh, to which uh, I have added a kind of post-face or post-script, uh, which I devoted to the issue of the art of hope, or the art of hoping as a kind of symmetric to the art uh, of memory. It has no direct relationship with what I am going to talk about uh, today, except that, of course, uh, the situation we are into uh, globally is uh, quite hopeless, uh, 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 and this is precisely uh, why I think hope, um, instead of being you know, something that uh, optimists have and pessimists lack, should be considered as an art, as a matter of art. That's something that you have to cultivate you know, uh, actively. And I think architects, uh, just like uh, farmers, uh, uh, should be athletes in the of the art of hoping uh, nowadays. Okay. So now for 20 years I've been teaching in schools of architecture about environmental history, uh, thinking that it's good to have a kind of rear view mirror, uh, you know, when we are addressing uh, these big issues, um, because maybe we can find some kind of jurisprudence uh, uh, in the past. And history is about, you know, the duration or not of uh, things. And this is uh, the exhibition that we did and which we still develop um, in every new, uh, at every new iteration uh, of this exhibition, um, was focused, uh, is focused on um, the relationship of those two fields of activities uh, which actually um, emerged at the same time, roughly, uh, in our history, in what we call the Neolithic uh, uh, period, um, so that they are, in a way, twin uh, disciplines. And that um, uh, it's interesting, I think, for uh, architects to look at what is happening in this other field of activities and the way people nowadays question the rationality of uh, uh, agriculture might be a treasure of uh, lessons uh, for designers uh, also. 
Um, so this exhibition, that was the plan of the initial exhibition we did in, in Lisbon. Um, at, the t at the time, I was working, uh, I was teaching for the students of Harvard uh, in, uh, implied or involved in uh, Rem Kohlhaas' project of an exhibition on the countryside. And it just happened at some point that um, uh, we seized the opportunity of the Lisbon Triennale to do a kind of transatlantic footnote to his uh, uh, exhibition, focusing on this issue of agriculture precisely. We didn't have the Guggenheim. Uh, we had the giant uh, parking lot uh, of the, in Lisbon uh, there. And we organized the exhibition like that. I just show you the plan because it kind of uh, explains the thing. In the nave, uh, uh, here we had like six, now there are eight series of uh, thematic um, um, uh, panels. Um, six, six themes, like it was like uh, agriculture and architecture, uh, uh, agriculture and urbanism from agronomy to agroecology, uh, uh, exit orbs, looking at uh, those moments, uh, different moments in history when there was a kind of disurbanization, uh, stuff like that. Um, and then focusing a uh, fifth uh, series on um, facing the environmental predicament uh, today. And uh, uh, finally looking um, at um, a particular way of questioning the rationality of agriculture today that has been developed by agroecology, but also by this movement, well-known movement by now, of permaculture, which uh, presents itself as a kind of um, uh, design discipline applied uh, to um, planning or managing resilient producing sites. Right? And in my view, uh, this is a treasure trove of um, uh, design lessons, uh, not only for uh, uh, farmers, but for everyone and for designers, uh, particularly today. Okay. Um, so this is <clears throat> then then at, in the choir there, uh, we, we are looking today, because all, the, all of this is a kind of big jurisprudence of moment in history that we might want to have in mind when we are questioning the present situation. And in the end, uh, and I'll, I'll go to that at the end of this uh, uh, lecture, a kind of compass or windrows uh, showing different narratives uh, about the future uh, of the relationship between agriculture and architecture, uh, uh, metropolises and the countryside, uh, etc. Okay. And that was accompanied by a huge timeline, 60 meters uh, timeline, illustrated timelines that we did with a friend who is an uh, illustrator, um, uh, to help people, visitors, locating these different moments within a kind of continuous uh, 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 history uh, there. And I will actually use today that timeline uh, to make a kind of uh, swift uh, visit or tour through the argument of the exhibition. Okay. So that, that's what it looked like, uh, hardliner uh, <laughs> uh, exhibition, a deck of cards you see uh, in space. On the back of those cards, we just put images that are more familiar to architects uh, that didn't need any explanation and that kind of resonated with the, the, the thing. That was in Lyon, uh, this is in Marseille, etc. Okay. So, um, we want to look at that uh, uh, whole history, almost from prehistory, uh, from the Paleolithic uh, to uh, today. So, of course, <clears throat> we all know, of course, it's more complicated than that, but that basically what we call agriculture, horticulture, uh, emerges in that vague period. It can go over millennia, uh, depending on the... the, the the area of the world where you are, when um, slowly um, uh, people start 
uh, to domesticate plants and animals, some plants and animals, um, and at the same time, by domesticating those uh, uh, plants and animals, uh, start to domesticate themselves within more permanent and sedentary uh, situations, right? So hence agriculture uh, in the broad sense of the word and uh, architecture in the precise sense that we give to that word kind of are uh, taken in a kind of autocatalytic uh, uh, movement from that period uh, on. Okay, so, um, yeah, a phenomenon of domestication, to take up the expression uh, used by James E. Scott in his wonderful book about first uh, cities. From those different cradles of um, domestication, uh, after a period of three to four millennia, uh, usually you get, you know, what we call cities, complex uh, uh, societies. Again, it's not that simple. It's not that linear. Uh, David Graeber, in his last book, like really investigated very well all these things. But nevertheless, nonetheless, uh, globally, you have that kind of thing that happens. Um, on the different uh, uh, continental uh, uh, masses from those cradle of Neolithic uh, uh, domestication, a few millennia, three to five, and you get, you know, what uh, uh, archaeologists uh, named, you know, uh, cities, cities, big complex uh, 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 cities. Um, the urban revolution, as um, uh, the famous uh, Australian archaeologist, whose name I, I don't remember right now, uh, anyway, uh, could name the urban uh, uh, revolution. So complex societies, monumental uh, architecture, usually very um, uh, intensive uh, forms of agriculture, slavery or serfdom, uh, division of labor, uh, social stratification, uh, all of this. Based, uh, according to most testimonies, on an intensification of agriculture. A modernization, you could say, with new uh, technologies at the time. This is the, the panel in, the, in our exhibition, uh, we, which we did for uh, what the Roman called the captatio benevolentiae, to capture you know, the, the, the uh, benevolence of architects, uh, to explain this is a real subject. <laughs> you know. um, um, which is this hypothesis uh, developed by Gerd Peschkin that um, <clears throat> the model of the Greek temple uh, would be the granary. Uh, the granary that could be built in stone, in wood, uh, from Ukraine to Galice, uh, uh, everywhere, which was a very functional uh, uh, building um, that you would necessarily find in those uh, uh, communities and that the, the Doric temple would be basically a kind of sublimation uh, of the granary. Of course, <clears throat> at the moment, uh, the temple was not a granary, so it was a sublimation of the granary at the very moment when Greece started to specialize its agriculture into vine, wine, and oil, uh, basically and to start to depend for its basic uh, commodities uh, on regions on the, Med in the, on the Mediterranean uh, shores that they would subject uh, for that, you know. Uh, so, but it's, that's sublimation. Sublimation is like uh, um, pretending or <clears throat> celebrating certain values, you know, like autonomy, like everything, at the very moment when you know you are putting them in danger uh, there. Okay, <clears throat> then, oh, it's very classical <laughs> history. 
that confused and long period that we call the, the Middle Ages, uh, like approximately a thousand uh, years, which started to be uh, in Europe um, a moment of disurbanization. The first part is a large disurbanization. Uh, uh, and the emergence of um, um, kind of um, uh, local uh, organization, which later became called the feudal uh, uh, system, which implied a lot of um, commons, uh, common uh, lands, uh, uh, where a number of custom rights uh, applied uh, that were far from defining what we call private property, uh, other ways you know, of dealing uh, with the soil, three-field system, uh, uh, etc. Uh, and th that developed during this period uh, for a quite long time and were, uh, by all standards, uh, sustainable for a long time. Um, uh, okay. At that time, <clears throat> a kind of ideal uh, could be represented by those uh, remote situations from the ex-cities. Uh, for instance, with uh, Roman uh, monasteries that were seeking you know, to be uh, uh, out there uh, and that became in those uh, places a kind of spiritual airports, but also um, um, laboratories of, um, um, for the development of uh, agricultural uh, uh, practices. Uh, even though mo many of those monasteries became later the cradles of, urban, uh, of urbanism in the second part of uh, the medieval uh, period. Then there is a, this period of three, five, uh, three to five centuries, which we could describe as the period when there is this rise of market economy, slowly. Uh, where market is not just a moment in the life of people, quite, uh, but becomes uh, slowly uh, a political model for uh, everything uh, there. Um, and it's, it's the moment, um, Karl Marx, um, the more I think about these issues, environmental issues, I must say the more I feel a Marxist, I become a Marxist. Um, uh, this is the period uh, during which uh, happened uh, for Marx what he calls primitive accumulation. What he mean, mean, means by primitive accumulation is the initial accumulation of capital by certain people, of the means of production, uh, etc., that uh, started the capitalistic regime that then developed almost by itself, right? Uh, from the end of the 18th century, especially from England uh, uh, here. Uh, you know that Marx explains that the law of capital accumulation, that is of growth, is that you have ever more, as growth go, um, the value goes more comparatively to what he calls constant capital, buildings, machines, uh, etc., that are owned by less and less people, relatively, and less uh, comparatively to the variable or living capital, work, uh, etc. Okay, that's the law of, ca of capital, but. For this to happen, there, there had to be a period where this system built up, and these are precisely, let's say, between the Renaissance, a bit earlier, and uh, uh, the 18th century. And this went through two basic uh, movements, which were the colonization, right, where you size, you know, the land, uh, take the people, uh, reinstate slavery uh, there for market agriculture, uh, tobacco, uh, coffee, uh, sugar cane, uh, stuff. Like that's, these are monocultures, you know, of uh, 
<coughs> trade, um, trade agriculture. And in the other countries, in Europe, for instance, uh, where this process happened, it was the big moment of the enclosure. You know? uh, the, pri the commons were privatized, were sized, you know. The uh, uh, um, private property became exclusive uh, private uh, property, so that all the people who survived uh, in a subsistence economy uh, of the commons uh, were left with almost nothing, only their hands, uh, that was the good that they could sell uh, to the manufacturer, and hence the industrial uh, revolution, uh, etc. <clears throat> so we have um, an industrial revolution that goes into different steps uh, here, uh, that is, as you all know, going to, uh, <clears throat> going to switch uh, from renewable, uh, basically, uh, resources to non-renewable uh, energy, energy, in terms of energy, uh, and in terms of materials, uh, also, uh, more and more. Um, and this first phase around uh, coal is also, it's also, it's not only a revolution in the kind of resources that you uh, ha harness, in a way, uh, but it's also a huge revolution in transportation, in circulation of goods. Uh, all that is solid melts into air to, you know, <laughs> take the Marxist uh, 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 stuff. So. Uh, it's a huge period, very well documented uh, now, where <clears throat> nature is being marketed, as William Cronin uh, described famously in his uh, book on, on, on Chicago. Uh, and it's the moment when the idea or the concept of urbanism appears. I mean, this is a very important, I think, uh, when, when urbanism, when you are uh, aware of that moment of emergence, doesn't mean the creation of new cities. It basically means uh, the uh, art of dealing with the incredible extension of existing cities, generally, uh, due to the acceleration of um, the industrial revolution, and to the uh, uh, rural exodus uh, that it produced, right? People flocked there uh, uh, in uh, more and uh, bigger and bigger uh, cities. It's important to say it because <clears throat> Françoise Choet, in a very good book that he, she published, uh, she's a historian of urbanism, in the mid-60s, uh, uh, went back, you know, uh, looked back retrospectively at, let's uh, at say, one, one century of urbanism and distinguished basically three big uh, movements, you know, in, in both the theory and practice of urbanism. One that she called the progressists, the culturalists, and the naturalists, right? The progressists, uh, in her view, uh, I would, I think it's a very good uh, distinction. These names are very good, except that I think it's important to use them as different ways of envisioning the extension of cities. Occasionally the creation, but the, the, the extensions of cities and metropolises. So I would say progressists are those who think that <clears throat> this extension is so formidable in terms of mass, etc., then in fact there is a change of nature. Uh, that the modern city is something else uh, that the, than the traditional or the classical or whatever you name it, uh, uh, cities, uh, pre-industrial uh, cities. So they th what they, the progressists say is that what must inspire urbanism, the extensions of cities, is the program, program of the modern city. Right? In a way, the, the, the Charte d'Athènes 
is a kind of very good example uh, of that, right? Uh, it distinguishes the functions, basic functions of uh, the modern city uh, and arranges them almost like a machine, right? Uh, the model is the machine, generally, uh, of uh, that thing. The culturalists <clears throat> are those like Camilo Cite or, you know, are those who say, well, come, <laughs> there's still an existing city. Right, that has a DNA, that has a, a particular grammar or syntax, relationship between private and public, and etc. You know, sequences, landscapes, townscapes, uh, stuff. What must inspire the extensions of those cities is that DNA. You know, that uh, those uh, previous uh, culture uh, of the city. And then <clears throat> there are the naturalists. Uh, it's funny because uh, François Choet had w only one big example. It was Frank, L Frank Lloyd Wright. I would not put Frank Lloyd Wright in that category. Uh, I would rather put people like uh, Olmsted, uh, for instance. That is, people who, designers who, for whom what must inspire the extension of cities. Of course, it's the program. Of course, it's the DNA, historical DNA. But it's the actual uh, land, uh, the topo its topography, hydrography, on which this extension happens. Right? Uh, it's that the substrate, in a way, the site, the geography, that must be, uh, in a way, there. Of course, it's a caricature that I do. Uh, no designer will really absolutely ignore uh, normally the others. But you can see that it's three different things. And I would add, <clears throat> there is in that category of the naturalist, there are those who go almost further uh, who are the regionalists. Like, for instance, Geddes, whom we mentioned uh, this morning. Geddes, with his famous uh, valley section, superimposing the section through the valley from the uh, mountains to, to the sea, uh, and just under, and, and with all the different activities, you know, from the mines to uh, the fisheries, uh, uh, the different kinds of agriculture all along, uh, etc. Superimposed to a section through um, the main city located, you know, uh, at the delta of such a, a, a water shed, uh, in a way. And you have a correspondence, you know, vertical correspondence between uh, all these activities and the way they concentrate in this big magnet of activity that is the city. For the regionalists, <clears throat> for Geddes, Geddes called uh, uh, his ideal discipline geotechnics, uh, an applied geography, geography that applied, that is, to making the earth more inhabitable, right? Uh, so for uh, Geddes and for the regionalists, the real subject of urbanism or geotechnics is not just the city, it's the region, right? Of which, of course, the city is the kind of condenser uh, or collector uh, there. Okay. <clears throat> um, and then during this period, even the, if, if they were not really... Uh, um, mentioned or heard, there are a few voices to say, well, maybe we, sh we should complement urbanism with a kind of symmetrical uh, discipline, uh, which uh, Liberty Hyde Bailey, a great uh, uh, agronomist, uh, 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 called ruralism. He said, basically, uh, urbanism only deals with the problem at the, at the end of the line, we should probably uh, de develop a discipline, ruralism, that would kind of try to uh, uh, keep uh, people uh, in the countryside, or at least give them reasons not to leave it, you know, uh, uh, make those places enjoyable, uh, uh, rich, <clears throat> and valuable. Then there is the other. Uh, of course, uh, steps in the Industrial uh, Revolution with oil, with electricity, um, what um, Geddes called the neotechnic, uh, after the paleotechnic of coal uh, there. 
where there is this acceleration of the whole process, acceleration in the uh, rural uh, exodus uh, again, especially with the great <laughs> uh, revolution in the field of uh, agriculture, uh, brought, up, brought uh, uh, by <coughs> Haber et Bosch, uh, for instance, who um, uh, developed the technology uh, to capture the nitrogen from the air, you know, and uh, produce uh, industrial uh, fertilizers there. My friend, agronomist Mathieu Calam, has this theory that the, he says basically the 19th century was the century of the industrial, uh, industrialization of arts and crafts. Uh, the 20th century was the, uh, uh, that of the industrialization of everything else and especially of agriculture. Uh, agriculture was, in, in a way, the last sector to be fully industrialized, but then it came big time. Uh, and his, the other article of his uh, argument is to say that the industrialization of agriculture was the recycling of the industry of war. Right? Uh, the technology of Haber-Bosch was ready before the First World War, but it was too expensive, too energy intensive. You basically had to produce uh, eclair, um, lightnings, uh, to precipitate uh, ammonia, etc. So it was only, but, but when uh, the war came, it was about the same process to, to do explosives. So the, it was developed and then recycled into uh, agriculture with strong intensive by governments uh, to use you know, these infrastructure. But barbed wire, uh, uh, tractors uh, that came from tanks, uh, etc. I don't do a uh, thing so. OK, so that uh, after the Second World War, basically uh, the motto was uh, get big or get out. That was the motto of uh, the uh, Secretary of Agriculture uh, uh, under the Nixon uh, years. Uh, it was a complete uh, change that gave its last touch to the incentive for complete uh, rural uh, uh, exodus, you know, uh, until 2% two, two or 1%, 2 3 in our uh, countries of people are involved in any way with uh, producing uh, uh, in agriculture uh, today. So an evacuation uh, of the countryside from people. Of course, tourists uh, uh, are using it. Same. Many people at that time, in the 20th, early 20th century, knew perfectly well that it was very dangerous to go in that way. Now, and like many movements for or agronomists, you know, who spoke about uh, agri agriculture permanent, permanent uh, organic agriculture, Albert Howard here, who was the equivalent of Guedes for agriculture. They actually both went to Indore uh, in India, uh, right? And they had exactly the same uh, uh, reaction. They were sent by the British Empire to uh, 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 India. Uh, to explain what urbanism and what agriculture was about. And, then, and both of them looked at this, uh, what the practice of compost, like where amazingly uh, <laughs> the wisdom involved in all these things, and kind of switched. Uh, Geddes knew already that he was going to switch but at that time. But, but Howard, uh, literally, uh, who coined the concept basically of organic and principle of organic agriculture, that was from this encounter with the science uh, involved in vernacular practices uh, in uh, uh, India, anyway. And others explored, I mean, what time is it? If I must uh, be careful, yeah. Uh, finally, <coughs> um, we arrived to the current period, uh, described as the great acceleration in the consumption and the production of all kinds of stuff that has brought up way uh, 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 beyond the planetary uh, uh, limits. We were talking about that uh, uh, this morning, which is the exact period when uh, big alarms, you know, uh, big uh, uh, alarm ringers uh, uh, in environmental, um, I mean, came. 
Blueprint for Survival, uh, The Ecologist, uh, the fantastic work of uh, Ho uh, Howard Odum uh, on the measures of energy uh, you know, consumed and uh, emergy uh, there, who explained in his book in 1971 that <clears throat> um, before um, uh, the stocks of very dense non-renewable -renew energies, you necessarily had a kind of dispersion of habitats and practice of other territories, and that the switch to dense uh, source uh, of energy naturally produces uh, concentration, concentration of people, megapolis, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, the Limits to Growth uh, report, um, you all know that, huh, I guess. Uh, uh, and people who start, you know, advocating for a kind, going a kind of post-industrial technology. Among the representative of that idea, there was a student at the AA, uh, an architect called Colin Moorcraft. Who knows Colin Moorcraft? Colin Moorcraft was this young architect, completely into uh, 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 ecology, you know, at the end of the 60s, uh, early 70s, when Rem Kolas was here, actually. They were to, and I actually uh, asked Rem, he said, yeah, I remember him, I remember the guy, you know. And this guy uh, had a column in architectural design on environmental uh, uh, issue. He even did a book on why the seas must die, that was translated in French the same year. I mean, he was like really, and he was still a student uh, at the AA. And in 1972, short, shortly uh, after the publication of the, <clears throat> of the Limits to Growth uh, report, he um, uh, did a whole issue of uh, architectural design called uh, Design for Survival, Designing for Survival, with many examples of work being done by students at the time and elsewhere. And he had a big article called Designing for Survival, which was a very powerful analysis, was very good at, to do it at that time, a, a criti very harsh critic of the Green Revolution and what it was bringing about everywhere, you know, in the third world, the same uh, uh, rural exodus, uh, uh, etc., the, the, the loss of traditional knowledge, uh, uh, less uh, um, <coughs> uh, subsistence, more market, etc. everywhere. Okay. And he ended his um, plea by um, a part called um, Beyond Industrial Technology, in which he explained we should devise uh, technologies uh, uh, that would have at least three um, three virtues. One he called um, uh, integrity. So it meant that uh, it was typically uh, technologies or a technological uh, system that would minimize the number of entrants uh, 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 and minimize their externalities and would be circle, you know, in a way. Most that we, they can, typical concept of ecologists today. Second was they should be flexible. And by flexible, he meant conceivable, adaptable, repairable by their own users or by the community that uses them in a reasonable orbit, right? They should be, they should be able you know, to deal with them, not be black box that they indebt themselves for uh, years you know, and that, they, that dictates to them their mode of operation. Uh, no, it should be, uh, and thir third, third virtue was they should be cooperative, by which he meant they should be um, technologies in which each element fulfills several functions, and each function is fulfilled by several elements. So a kind of functionalism, right? But the opposite of the uh, functionalism of the tw 20s in architecture, where indeed, you know, you had to identify the elements that was the more efficient to do the thing, separate the stuff, uh, etc. The model was not anymore the machine for this alter functionalism. It was, say, the ecosystem, where indeed uh, uh, several, you know, 
uh, each element fulfills several uh, functions, uh, uh, etc. And you, I, I mentioned that because, in a way, permaculture, as it was developed uh, a few years later, in 78, was the exact, in a way, uh, fulfilling of that program uh, in uh, uh, the managing uh, inside planning, in a way, managing of uh, productive uh, lands. Okay, so uh, that's the moment, you know, uh, when the great acceleration, paradoxically, uh, starts to take up, you know, uh, in a way. Uh, all these guys think little. Uh, the whole, you know, <laughs> the whole, the <clears throat> whole Earth catalog, you know, where those people in the west of the United States, you know, will flee the consumption society and the metropolises to go build a Buckminster Fuller thing in the desert, uh, start cultivating uh, stuff, etc. I love, I love the the motto of. Uh, workers of the world disperse. That is, you know, the inversion of the first sentence of uh, uh, the manifesto of uh, Marx and Engels, you know, disperse. This is a much better strategy if you want that system to collapse, you know, just uh, go, okay. So that was a big moment of, of the back to the land uh, uh, ideology. Uh, that might be back uh, soon and maybe much more efficiently uh, than it was. Then, that's about the end, in a way, of our, of our timeline. A kind of caricatural description of the situation today. At the center, uh, the city, omnipresent, uh, the metropolis, you know, uh, both in exploding, both in density, in a way, and in extension, uh, there, surrounded uh, by a series of big issues. Uh, water scarcity uh, or water stress uh, uh, progressing, dr progressing uh, dramatically, um, soil erosion, uh, soil, soil pollution, uh, here, climate change and biodiversity uh, collapse, uh, uh, emerging uh, disease uh, uh, linked to, to deforestation, uh, for instance. And last but not least, big uh, uh, problems uh, on uh, the stocks and reserves of uh, what fed the Industrial Revolution, uh, that is uh, non-renewable energies, but also non-renewable materials, you know, like copper, I don't know, I mean, things that are completely essential to the electrifying everything or stuff, you know. So uh, that's for us was a way of describing the situation uh, we are now uh, into. In the middle, you see Rem Kolhas here. Uh, we put Rem uh, here because, in a way, he um, exactly <clears throat> he became the theoretician of uh, a creed or belief that um, innovation in urbanism, for instance, uh, is going to help us out of this just by flight forward. So he kind of exaggerated with his project Exodus. It's named Exodus. It means like, you know, uh, uh, accelerating this idea of the rural Exodus that started, you know, there, where even uh, urbanites or suburbanites would become the voluntary prisoners, you know, of a very dense uh, 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 architecture, city architecture there. So he, in a way, uh, 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 represented that kind of, uh, you know, uh, how do you say, um, vanishing point of, of that perspective uh, there, uh, which in a way, you know, is there uh, today. You know, the line in a way is not very far from Exodus, uh, you know, in, in many uh, respects, you know, except that it doesn't eat a city. It like extends into the desert. It's different, but uh, uh, it's uh, in a way a translation. Anyway, 
This idea, it's very interesting to note that uh, Deleuze New York was published in 78, that in that decade where all these guys, you know, were uh, writing like uh, their, their concerns. <clears throat> and uh, you, you remember probably that he advocates Manhattanism, or what I call super urbanism, as a way to deal against what how he call, he calls it uh, reality shortage. So that was the oil shortage year, and he kind of explodes it into reality shortage. We are too numerous now, etc. Uh, and in a way, <clears throat> if you want to get out of that predicament of reality shortage, you have to sur regenerate reality. That was exactly the kind of discourse that the nuclear plants were had been developing, you know, sur regenerateur, uh, you know, sur uh, energy sur, sur, surrealism, uh, uh, in a way. The, the, the metropole was that, and the genius of the Industrial Revolution was he, its ability with innovation, you know, to, in a way, uh, find a way uh, out. Of course, at the same time, uh, he would, uh, with Ungers, uh, hear those things about possibility of degrowth, uh, uh, which they explored exactly that same year in, uh, on the example of Berlin. So where to go at that time? What was going to be you know, the solution? Nobody knew. I would sum up the, the situation we are in like this. I think today, anybody that keeps informed you know, uh, on the big issues is confronted to a highly perplexing uh, situation. On the one hand, and this is what we just did, when you look back at the past, at least the two to three last uh, centuries, you can avo cannot avoid the idea that the progressive urbanization of the world you know, is inevitable is integral to history, that it's the sense of, of, of history. Yeah? But at the same time, when uh, probing the future and looking at the environmental issues we just mentioned, this same global urbanization uh, looks rather improbable, impossible, and like the end uh, of history. So how are we to deal with a situation that looks both inevitable and impossible. Uh, in a way, our exhibition was uh, a way to help us <laughs> as, deal with that. Because you have two kinds of um, you have two kinds of attitude basically today that oppose themselves. Uh, like Charles Mann uh, 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 explained very well in his book, "The Wizard and the Prophet." The wizards are those like Norman Borlo, who was the, the key figure of the Green Revolution, you know, accelerating the selection of big cultivars like uh, uh, corn, wheat, uh, and, uh, and rice, uh, basically, uh, to save uh, the world. Uh, those are the people who, in front of, in a situation that looks both uh, uh, inevitable and impossible, are going to make the inevitable possible. You know, just by you know innovation that is going to push you know the apparent limits uh, 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 of the earth, no. and they are uh, in front of them uh, like uh, <clears throat> uh, what's his name again? Uh, the author of the Road to Survival, one of the first uh, environmental books of just after the war in '47, William Fox. William Fox, who was an ornithologist, etc., uh, who um, uh, wrote, who is a, an exemplification, like Malthus, in a way, of uh, the people who say, no, uh, the system has limits, uh, and uh, uh, you know, the goal is to learn to live within uh, those limits. And of course, they say to the wizards, you can, you can in a way, uh, of pass over the limits for a certain time, but at the cost of uh, those limits, re asserting themselves more violently uh, 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 thereafter. So in a way, we, I wanted to, to uh, defend or, or praise the prophets uh, in our exhibition. Prophets like uh, people, L'Atelier Paysan, for instance, in France, that advocates 
the installation of uh, one million new peasants uh, in France when they are uh, at the number is not even the half of that uh, today. Of course, to practice differently uh, architecture. And of course, uh, David Holmgren, who uh, is one of my heroes, I must say, uh, uh, today, one of the most articulated uh, 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 design theoretician, I would say, uh, today, and certainly an athlete in the art of hoping. Um, uh, by the way, it's also 78 permaculture, like Delirious New York, right? So, <laughs> the same year, not exactly the same uh, thing. Well, I will pass on that, on what permaculture is, because I, I've been told we have to stop in 10 minutes. So uh, I pass on permaculture, I'm sorry uh, for that. But let's say that what he does uh, there, I, in the book that is going to be republished soon, the last sentence of my book, I quote myself, you see, <laughs> uh, was, was our, our century is no longer, ours is no longer the century of expanding cities, but rather of deepening territories. And I, I, did, I, didn't, I didn't know uh, permaculture at that time. I hadn't read David Ongren, but when I did, I had the feeling that uh, the art of, of hope had a theory. Uh, uh, and that uh, David Holmgren, can I use that? Yeah, yeah, it works. In a book uh, that he published in 2008, uh, David, sorry, maybe it's, it's better if I stay there, right? Okay. Uh, in a book that he published in 2008, it's called Future Scenario, and he does an exercise that I think is absolutely uh, enlightening. David says, basically, we are confronted to two kinds of problems at the same time. One he calls global warming. It's the vertical axis here. But you could add a, a biodiversity uh, collapse, soil erosion, uh, water scarcity. You could call it more generally Progressive degradation of the conditions of life on our planet, right? Of which all these phenomena are different species, right? Uh, and it can be slow <laughs> on the down or up, uh, more problematic. And each IPCC report every four years uh, puts up a higher on that uh, thing. And that's, of course, enormous issues. But at the same time, there are other kind of problems, unfortunately. And this other kind, he calls it uh, oil decline. But again, you could add uh, gas, oil, um, uh, coal, but also not only energy, materials, copper, uh, uranium, uh, I, you name it, right? Uh, so we could call this other axis the progressive diminution of the capacity of humanity to transform the world, right? the power to act and transform the world. So when you cross those two things, you obtain different scenarios. If, for instance, you have, that's the best situation, slow global warming, and you still have a lot of power right, uh, to act. Then he calls that scenario green tech. Then you're able to go have wind turbine on an industrial you know, uh, uh, level because you still have materials and energy and fossil energy, right? Uh, so you can prepare for the moment when things are going to de uh, into bigger degradation, right? You can hope that you can stabilize uh, or adapt to that thing. But that's the best scenario. If you are confronted to a more destructive degradation of the conditions of life, but you still have a lot of power, there you can uh, see a very dirigist uh, state. They still have a lot of power. You know, They can act. They can control uh, the situation. See raising uh, uh, level. Ah, you, you use concrete, you know, you big big dams, you, you have, you know, uh, power, etc. So you can, it, you, you enter in a very, very uh, 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 powerful state structure that control uh, the things. Fascism, 
in the, in the original sense of the world, you know, where you converge all the forces toward a, a goal. If you are in the opposite situation, where <clears throat> it's still okay, <laughs> uh, but you have a fast uh, material and energetic decline, which might be, we might be already in uh, that thing, ah, then you are in the exact condition which are the reverse that those which created the Industrial Revolution. So maybe uh, it will be the reverse consequence. Urban exodus, people leave the centers of concentration to take care of energy where it is in the form of living uh, organism, of course with completely different ways of uh, cultivating things than uh, industrial agriculture. And finally, you have the worst scenario where both are in red, right? Which is, by the way, the, the, the survivalist uh, uh, scenario, uh, which he calls uh, lifeboats. No, no world wars in that last scenario. You don't do world wars with, uh, without big uh, 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 energetic and material resources. But still, it's Mad Max. You know, uh, or a kind of new feudal uh, uh, system. I think it's very interesting uh, thing to cross those two things. And I think it, there is a large, it's very consistent and relevant to, to combine political reflection with biologic and, and, and physical, let's say, uh, affairs. And David explains that these scenarios, although they are defined by uh, different uh, conditions, are not exclusive of one another. Uh, first, because there are areas in the world that are in a different situation of another. But even in one region, it de also depends on the people who think that this or this or this or this is going to happen, you know, and who are going to. So they are, uh, uh, in a way, uh, like Russian puppets, you know, uh, within, located within one another. And even in one individual, they can be uh, simultaneously present. You know, on the domestic level, oh, you cultivate your own fruits, your own garden, your everything, you are resilient, you know, autosufficient. In the community, uh, you share, uh, you are in a... Then uh, uh, you work maybe in a company that produce uh, wind turbines, you know. <laughs> and finally, when you vote, you want a strong, <laughs> a strong, you know, uh, in case, you know, uh, the thing. So what we did in the exhibition, that was the last thing, and I conclude like that, is a, a kind of different exercise uh, but I just wanted to clarify the different environmental discourse that I hear among architects and planners and things, uh, where they all, you know, speak environment, but in fact they often say very, very different things. So it's a different thing on the relationship between cities and countryside. One I call incorporation. It looks a bit like the first uh, scenario of Holmgren, that one. Incorporation in the sense that we have an industrial revolution 2, 3, 4.0, uh, uh, because you know, it's the creed that only a new revolution is going to save us from the externalities of the preceding one. Right? So flight forward, and uh, uh, the city absorbs agriculture and becomes the tower of control of high tech you know, uh, of the rest of the territory in a way. So you have Elon Musk uh, Hyperloop uh, there. You have uh, cities, uh, buildings that grow food, hydroponic uh, stuff. Now. Second scenario, uh, negotiation. Negotiation, it's the idea, that's a bit uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, 2.0. It's the idea that the city is still going to grow, but that it is going to integrate as part of its program, agriculture, horticulture, forestry, or everything. You know. So uh, many architects are very, very, they find it very, very good because, you know, you, not only you still uh, uh, build, but you even become uh, agricultural experts uh, uh, <laughs> on the on thing. Okay? Then there is, uh, you could say this is agricultural urbanism. And then you have the opposite, which is urban agriculture, which I call infiltration, where 
many, you know, uh, uh, horticulture initiative uh, permeates the existing uh, city. Uh, that's, uh, so it's, it's usually not planned, but it can happen big time. For instance, in Detroit, after the, the collapse of the in, uh, automobile industry, in Cuba, in the uh, special period, where it became suddenly, you know, without uh, Soviet import, it became the mecca uh, of permaculture. It's fortunately uh, finished nowadays. And there is an another last Last uh, scenario, and I finish with this, uh, which I call secession. It's a bit brutal. Uh, where people leave the cities, people individually or collectively uh, leave the cities, uh, uh, even when they are in the orbit, physical orbit of the city, to become more uh, self-sustainable locally and abandon uh, urbanism. Uh, I, I see that I have to, 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 to finish. I leave you with this uh, question. I'm sorry. Uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, sorry.